Well, by the time I actually got around to meeting Marilyn, she was already something, at the beginnings at least, of a legend. I knew that she was going to appear in uh, the movie of my play, The Seven Year Edge. And I knew her, her genuine, almost childlike passion for pets and animals. And I knew that she would, she would identify not with the victims of the creature of the Black Lagoon, but with the creature from the Black Lagoon itself. Didn't you just love the picture? I did. But I just felt so sorry for the creature at the end. Sorry for the creature? Why'd you want him to marry the girl? He was kind of scary looking, but he wasn't really all bad. I think he just craved a little affection, you know, a sense of being loved and needed and wanted. That's a very interesting point of view. <laughs> oh, do you feel the breeze from the subway? Isn't it delicious? In order to get that, you had to have a man with a wind machine down inside this pit. Now, you got to remember his vantage point. He was looking up at Marilyn this way, and he had this machine. He, he went out of his mind and began to like this. The skirts went up like that, and suddenly we had the movie made. It was, and she just loved it. She went, oh, try it again. It's lovely. Oh, here comes another one. By the time Marilyn was ready to come back to Hollywood, we had, by that time, perfected, in our opinion, a vehicle for her in which she could really shine, in that she could uh, do everything that she could do that was sexy and wonderful and delicious and exciting and tender and dirty and all the great things she could do, and still be just outside that pasteboard character that 20th had invented for her. Difficulty in lines would be an understatement for Miss Monroe. Miss Monroe simply could not memorize anything. She could not memorize, when she lived on Lexington Avenue, which she did in New York, she could not, not memorize Lexington Avenue. Joe Curtis's voice says, I've always wanted love. He talks like a dialogue director. Marilyn says, I've always dreamed. Joe, what the f was you? I, cut. <laughs> but nobody dares say cut. So we just says, go on, darling, go on, darling. We came in through the back entrance of the uh, Beverly Hills Hotel by the swimming pool and walked across it. And the swimming pool of the Beverly Hills Hotel is, of course, something else again. It's this ice blue water surrounded by uh, William Morris office agents, exhibitors who are there on holiday, and the agents are drinking bright red Bloody Marys, stirring them with green plastic swizzle sticks, and it's the healthiest atmosphere you've ever seen in your life. And Marilyn suddenly grabbed my arm, you know, in genuine terror. And I said, what's the matter? What's the, matter? What's the trouble? She said, well, I always have to hold on to people when I'm in spooky places. If, if Marilyn were alive today, she would indeed be 46. She'd be moved into the younger Bette Davis position, which wouldn't have been Marilyn's game at all. Perhaps I over-romanticize it, but Marilyn was indeed a bird of passage. She made a tremendous impact during the rather limited time that she passed through our lives. And I'm not speaking from her point of view, but surely from everybody else's, it, it, it's better to remember it that way. 